So when you went to school here, it was in the old yeah. brick school? Yes, so. and that was built in 1922 and closed up in what, 67? Because they opened the new one in 68, so. Yeah. So it was open for 45 years. And this one has been open for 50. Yeah. So this new school is. It's the winner. It's, it's the longest run. You know. Oh, that that old school. There was some. There was some wonderful times there. So what was the layout of that school? Because I mean, I've seen pictures, but it's like. Well, you. It was about three steps uh, up concrete steps up the entryway, and big heavy double doors. You go in, and it was. Uh, 15 foot entryway, I'd say. And then it opened up into a, a large hallway with a railing in what was originally the gymnasium that when I was a kid was used as the lunchroom and the auditorium because there was a stage there. But years when it first built, it was also the gym and that's where they played basketball. And you had uh, to the right, you had the superintendent's office, and then the third and fourth grade. And to the left, you had the first and second grade. And then beside those were the stairs that went upstairs. Up the west stairs, at the top of the stairs, was the fifth and sixth grade. Up the East stairs at the top of the stairs was the seventh and eighth grade, and then in the middle of all of that was the high school. So with all the country schools around, was there actually more kids in the high school than there was in the elementary? Well, I don't remember what the numbers were. Uh, we had 70 some kids in school when I was in school. So it's about the same? Yeah. There were 11 in my graduating class, and. A uh, couple more, a couple less than that on either side of me. So it wasn't great huge numbers. The big numbers were back in the, the 50s and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, just remembering this, the, some of the kids and the things, uh, like the year that, you know, one of the trips that our boys made to state tournament. Somebody said, oh, never did this before. I said, oh yeah, 1953 <laughs> was the first year that Hinsdale went to state tournament. And my grandfather was a great supporter of sports and one thing and another. Hinsdale did not have school bus. So I don't know who the other transportation provider was, but Grandpa loaded part of the team in his big old Oldsmobile and off to Conrad they went. Well, it was probably better than Conrad than some of the places they have to go now, like Bozeman. That would have been a heck of a ride. Well, it's, it's interesting that the, uh, I, I'm, I swear there's got to be politics involved in some of these tournament locations. Uh, Hamilton has to be the absolute worst tournament location in the world. And I've had to go there a couple of times, but uh, it's a little out of the way. Way, and the accommodations you can't get a room half the time, and no, it's just not a good deal. But they keep going back there, so I think that somebody has some pull somewhere. Well, they start getting in those rotations, and I feel like they're set for quite a while sometimes. Well, and then the the thing that I was amazed at when we were there in 2014. Uh, and the Hinsdale girls took second, is here we are sitting on the one side and you look across and the whole upper deck is empty except for about three people. Now that tells me that, you know, it's not being very well handled. Yeah, it's you not know, the community's not showing up, it's them not feeling they can get there. When you could, you know, when you go to Belgrade, you know, they've got about the same size gym, but that place is packed and it rocks. Yeah. You know, so. 
Yeah, so the old brick school over here, it had some, they had the main building and then they had additions to it because isn't the shop and the library, isn't that part of the old? Well, the shop and the, and I don't know what it's called now, but they built the first grade uh, over there. And that was done in the early 50s. And the shop, you know, and that was there at the same time. And to the east was the band room on the, shall we say, main ground level. Mm -hmm. And then the gym that you'd have to go down, it was built down into the ground. And that was uh, constructed as part of the WPA Work mm -hmm. Project Association or administration, whatever, in the, in the 30s. Yeah, I've been trying to figure that out because, what was it, 2010, 2011, we built that greenhouse back there. And we found out that they didn't take that stuff out, they just buried it. So when we did the foundation, we ran into the old foundation of the gym or whatever was right there. And we had to move it, and we still hit it. So that uh, greenhouse is basically right on the corner of that old foundation which I thought was kind of cool. It made it a lot harder to build that greenhouse when you're going through cement and then everything else was piled inside that. So we were pulling out rebar and big hunks of scrap iron. It was kind of interesting because I didn't know that there was that building back there. Oh, it was, uh, it was quite, quite the deal. <clears throat> there was uh, maybe 18 inches from the end line to the wall and on both ends and maybe on the both sides, they had uh, two little alcoves over on the south side, or north side, I mean. Uh, one had a elevated bench that the scorers and everybody sat in, and the other one was just kind of there. Uh, and then the team benches were just wooden benches along the walls. Yeah, I remember we played in a gym that was kind of like that up in Turner when I was in high school. And they had that secondary line that you had to stand behind when the person was outing the ball because you couldn't use the... No, oh, ours was big enough you didn't have to have that. But, but I remember in Turner, I physically couldn't stand behind the line because of my feet. <laughs> it was too close to the wall. Well, it's, uh, you know, we had right basically underneath the basket and then on the wall on both ends were these heavy pads hung on the walls. But they only covered, oh, a total of maybe 10 feet. So there were a few rather nasty crashes that went on over the years. People charging hard for a ball or, you know, whatever, and smack into the wall. Yeah, if they were playing today, they probably would have had a few concussions. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, there's so many things that are different. You know, we didn't have the three-point shot. Uh, there's a couple of kids that we, you know, had. Uh, Gary Copenhaver was an exceptional shooter. He was in the class of 62. And uh, I always, you know, swore over the years that if uh, there would have been a three-point line, He'd have probably held every record in the world because he could shoot from <laughs> way downtown. So. Yeah, they've really changed the game a few times. And they, I don't think they kept those kind of records back there either. Probably you not. Know? And they probably weren't really reported to the association or anything uh, else. What do you think about when they talk about trying to add a shot clock to high school? Well, I, I, I'm kind of against it simply for the economic factor. Because the people that will be the most impacted by that will be the small schools. Here we are, we're co op and Seiko, Whitewater, and Hinsdale. So that means, you know, to keep things fair, we rotate the games from one place to another. So that means we have to have three shot clock systems. That's not, you know, those things aren't cheap. I, I'm just guessing that you couldn't put in one for less than $2,500. Well, that's $7,500 for, you know. <coughs> yeah, that's a lot of money. I don't think it's fair for the small schools. 
uh, those big schools that, you know, uh, are able to send one luxury cruiser bus, you know, for their boys, while that school sends their luxury cruiser bus with their girls down, and then they alternate the next night, and I'm going, what? You know, wouldn't it be more economical for everybody to travel in one bus? But, yeah. So, in your opinion, who were the big community members? Who kind of defined Hinsdale? <clears throat> well, when I was a kid, things were a, a, a lot different. Uh, Maybe it's my perception, but I think they were more business-like. Uh, you had Bob Claypool and, and his dad, Homer, running the grocery store here. Uh, I don't know if I ever remember Homer without a tie. You know, he had his white apron on. He might be back cutting meat or whatever, but he had a tie on. My grandfather was the the banker, he always wore a suit and tie. Fred Westrom, he ran the hardware store, he always had a tie on. Joe Stuber, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but bar business is a lot more casual. Uh, the gas stations, they all had uniforms. Uh, and they, you know, it's just the way it was. You could go to a Texaco station uh, anywhere down the road. They're all wearing that same dark green uniform with the red star. That's a Texaco deal. Phillips 66, they had their uniforms. And so it, you know, it was a, a lot more formal. Yeah. Uh, your uh, lodge meetings on whatever nights they had them. All those guys showed up for lodge. They all wore suits and ties. And I mean, it was, that was the way they did it then. Now you see the guys show up for lodge meetings and you know, yeah, they're here. <laughs> <laughs> so Things have gotten a little bit more casual. <laughs> very much so. You really don't see anyone wearing uniforms anymore of any sort. No, unless you work at McDonald's or something. You know. <laughs> then it's just a hat. <laughs> oh, is that all it is? A hat and a name tag, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> well, I don't go in there either, so. Yeah. So, what were the big, the big events in Hinsdale? What was kind of throughout the year? Did they ha always have the 4th of July celebration, or was that only no, after the bicentennial? The, or? the 4th of July, the big celebration, uh, that didn't start until they started the Milk River Days thing. It, they didn't have an annual thing when I was a kid. I can remember uh, going on family camping trips over the 4th of July to the Little Rockies and stuff. Some families would go to Fort Peck. Uh, New Year's dance at, at the Legion Hall was always a big deal, you know. And uh, they always had like a three-piece band, a trio, you know. And I don't know how these people always got them put together, but there was always, it seemed like every band that ever played it, the little dances, it was always a trio, you know. And now they'd have to have so much sound equipment that nobody could afford to hire the trio either. But they, they don't play loud enough. <laughs> so in those days, it was uh, a set of drums, I remember these three girls from Seiko used to play. They had a set of drums, saxophone on the piano, and the, wherever the dance was, in this case at the Legion Hall, they had the piano, so they, you know. But yeah, it was, it was a completely different deal. Uh, the Valley County Fair, it wasn't the Northeast Montana Fair at that time, it was the Valley County Fair. That was a big deal, and that was in August. Uh, I notice 
you know, they have it earlier, seem to have it earlier and earlier. Well, it loses a lot having it earlier because uh, people can't uh, enter some of their uh, garden crops, they can't enter their grain, uh, things that used to be a, a, a big thing to enter into the, uh, the fair. We always used to have fun because we'd go down there, we'd always have some friend who had some kind of livestock entered in the fair, and we'd go down and take our sleeping bags and sleep in a stall and just have fun down there for a whole week or however long it ran. And uh, got somebody convinced one time that the girls really liked the smell of sweaty horses. So take this horse out and run it up pretty good and get it sweated up a little bit and then rub yourself all over it. So <laughs> then, we hid the, then we hid the rest of his clothes so for about three days he stunk like a sweaty horse. So. <laughs> Sounds like something you would do, huh, Trey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you remember when they had the flagpole in the middle of the street? Oh, absolutely. The flagpole was legendary. It was a big concrete base and a, just a giant steel flagpole. And it was, uh, it had a chain to run the flag up with instead of a rope. I think the rope would have never lasted and that's probably why they had the chain on it. But uh, the young people in those days were not, I won't say mean, uh, they were adventurous. Uh, Halloween was a great time around here. Morning after Halloween, it was not unusual to show up and have something run up the flagpole. One of my fond memories is coming uptown to see a couch up there. There was a building just to the south of uh, Claypool's store, like a lot difference in between there. And that was the liquor store, and old Bill Dick was a guy here in town that ran that at the time. And he just had this old couch he sat out beside the building, and they'd sit out there, and the boys would visit and such. Somebody wanted liquor, he'd go inside and take care of them. Other than that, they'd just sit out there. Well, the boys ran it up the flagpole. One of the other great uh, Halloween stories was uh, Westerman Rosendahl sold implements, uh, farm all. Well, somebody took a couple of the uh, toolbars and took them down to the school placed one in front of the main entrance and one in the entrance to the east along the gym that went in the back way. And then proceeded to cover them with straw. So the first few folks that went to wade through the straw to get to the doors banged into the toolbars. <laughs> They were much more creative back then. <laughs> oh, one of the best ones was, uh, I think it was my freshman year in high school. The word had gotten out that we needed to be at school early because there in the main hallway, the rope that came down from the roof came through the study hall up, upstairs and then down into the uh, main hallway and, and then clipped onto a hook there. You pull on that, you ring the school bell. And it's the same bell that's sitting out in front of the school now. So we got the word we needed to be there if we wanted to be entertained. So Roy Schultz was working at that time. And he always checked his time and had to ring the bell on time. So he goes to ring the bell and he pulls. Well, he usually took a couple pulls before he'd get to rocking enough to start ringing it. Pretty soon he's pulling it about four times. Nothing's happening. Pretty soon he just slowly looks up at the ceiling and he keeps ringing, but nothing's happening. Somebody had gotten up on the roof in the middle of the night on Halloween and 
took the clapper. Well, then they went up before the next bell was due to ring and they wired in a crescent wrench. So you go, clang, donk, <laughs> clang, donk. So that went three or four days with that. Then the threats were coming hot and heavy as to what was going to happen if they didn't get the clapper back. It magically showed up on Vernon Copenhaver's doorstep. Ha, ha, ha.